I'm the Executive Manager of the MEC Parkinson's King Street. Um, welcome to um, one of our many, hopefully, um, uh, speaker series. It's so nice to be able to offer them in this um, great space. Um, you know, there is over, well, we certainly invite, I think there's over 60 people here today, which is great. Um, and, as I was say, we opened this, um, this talk series up and we got a huge response. There was, um, you know, it closed up, we had to close the form after about 24 hours. People were, you know, really booking up and that means that people are really hungry for information. So I think um, it really tells us that we've got to do way more of these to keep people informed and get, um, get that knowledge out there. Um, we are recording on Facebook. Uh, so recording on um, yep. uh, Facebook Live. Yep. Oh, Facebook Live, right, yep. okay. And um, so that we can share this with a lot more people because that was the feedback that we got. That, um, so we can stick this on our website and people can um, you know, grab the information later on at their own leisure, which is great. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping. Um, we've got uh, three exits out of the building, probably this main one. The front um, door that you came in and out through the cafe is our main exit. Um, and the toilets are across the um, atrium there. There's some uh, uh, disability toilets down the um, corridor near the gym, if anyone needs that as well. Right, so now while you're here, um, is for me to introduce um, Dr. Matthew Croucher. So Matthew is a psychiatrist of old age and senior clinical lecturer with mixed clinical and academic roles in the University of Otago. Um, his main research institutes are in psychiatry of old age, are currently in service development, outcomes measurement and antipsychotic medicine. Um, but today Matthew is going to talk to us about coping, so I'll hand it over to Thank you very much, Carla. Well, kia ora kia koutou. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And to those of you that are watching today, it's great to have you here. And those that might watch later, it's good to uh, have your company as well. So um, let me tell you what I'm not here for, and that is to teach anyone how to suck eggs. And I'm not here to make light of MS or Parkinson's. Hard road, difficult. What I am here to do is to try and share with you a couple of different ways of thinking about how we cope. How do we do it? When we've managed it, how did we manage it? When we don't manage it, why was that? What could we do to try and help ourselves to cope a bit better with the curveballs that these illnesses throw into our lives? And some of us sitting here or listening aren't actually people who are living with multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease. We're, we're people who care a lot about someone else who's living with multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's. So how do we cope if we're in that, uh, that situation? So what I'll do is I'll just race through, well not race, I'll, I'll, we'll wander through together some of the important ideas that come from the science, but also that come from practical experience. Both mine, as a specialist with 20 years of trying to help people with Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis to manage different struggles that they have to face, but also 25 years of my experience listening to people who are managing <coughs> I hope to bring those two together and hopefully when you leave the room you have a couple more ideas of things that might be helpful for you or someone that you know well. So that, that's the point of it, right? So that's what I'm hoping. Now to spice it up, this is about coping with puppies. So you get the puppies for free today but I thought <laughs> I just had to sprinkle them in to try and help us to understand some of the concepts. So that is that is definitely something to look forward to. So a bit about me. So I'm based here at the New Burwood Hospital in Christchurch. 
uh, which as some of you may know, is uh, a hospital completely devoted to rehabilitation and to older person's health. Uh, there's also a bit of skin and a bit of um, head injury and a bit of, uh, a bit of orthopedic surgery thrown into the mix, but it's mainly about rehab and older person cells. So that's where I live now. I used to be out at Princess Margaret Hospital, which was great, so great, that I bought a wee house close to Princess Margaret <laughs> Hospital, but it's quite a schlep, I can tell you, to bike across to Burwood. So I don't always manage that. So I'm a Nelson boy. Some of you um, may have lived in Nelson, lovely place to grow up, um, but I'm really a Christchurch person now. I was born here, in fact, I was born at Burwood Hospital, but um, now I'm back here as an adult, I've raised my own children there, so uh, this is home. So lovely to be standing in front of you today. You can't talk about coping without talking about this man. So Professor Martin Seligman is an American professor of psychology who has been the major contributor in the science side of thinking about how do we cope. When it, when it goes well, why has it gone well? And when it goes badly, why has it gone badly? And his core model, developed in the late 60s, still stands. And I'll describe it to you today, and we'll work out together what, what clues it can give us for why things have gone well when they've gone well, and why things haven't gone well when they haven't gone well. His model is sometimes called the stress and coping model, because the two words go together. And I can't put Martin Seligman's picture up without adding this other delightful picture from uh, about the time that he came up with his model. I just think that's a really great picture. It just shows that black and white photography is infinitely better than the colour photography thing to bring across a personality. All right, so this is the stress and coping model with puppies in a nutshell. So Seligman suggests that any individual, and, and this is anything from an amoeba swimming around a pond to you, and everything in between. So the individual, the organism, is doing the business of being alive. And from Seligman's perspective, the business of being alive is about functioning in the real world the best you can. That's the business of being alive in this model. So the puppy, in our case, is just being a puppy and coping as best it can and functioning as best it can. But the trouble with the universe is that it's a dangerous place and it's full of stress. So it's not plain sailing for the amoeba, the puppy, or for you or me. We come under stress constantly. And stress is not like we mean it when we say, I'm stressed, or are you stressed by that? Stress to Seligman just means anything that can push you away from optimal functioning to something that's less than optimal. So it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just something that costs you. It could be a good thing, but it costs you. Getting married, having a wedding, these are good things, hopefully, but it's a bit exhausting. It's costly, the, you know, the whole business of going through that whole day of excitement and wonderful stuff, but you're exhausted at the end of it. Of course, marriage itself is just an endless series of wonderment, year after year, but the wedding, the wedding is difficult. So this is just an example of how stress isn't quite the same as when you and I use the word stress. Stress just means pressure on us that, if it was enough, might stop us from functioning optimally. That's how Seligman is looking at it. Coping is what we do as a response to that stress. Now, it may work well or it may work badly, it's just our response, our coping response. And it doesn't mean that the outcome is, is necessarily a great outcome. Coping is just what you do. The question is then, was it? Like, you know, did it work? So that, that's the stress and coping model in a nutshell. Very simple, just a simple series of ideas. But if we dive into this, 
we might learn some useful things that help us to understand why did I manage when I managed with that thing last week, but why am I not managing when I'm trying to struggle with this other thing this week? Stress and coping, what can it teach us? So let's go back to our wee organism that's under stress. The first thing to try and unpack is what are the different stresses that might affect our ability to keep on functioning in a good way? Seligman suggests there are four. We've talked about two of them already. One is positive but stressful events, like getting married. You know, things that you enjoy, they were good, they were good for us, but an aspect of them was nonetheless stressful. Then we have more negative stressful events, and this is what you and I mean when we say to each other, I'm stressed by that, or are you stressed out because of? We're talking about the big bad things that stress us. But sometimes the things that stress us are not events that happen, they're just the environment that we live in. It's fundamentally stressful. Everything is not laid on. There are difficulties just being there. And there are also stressful aspects to ourselves. We bring some things to the equation as well, don't we? And some of them are things that act as drag anchors on our ability to function optimally that are in our bodies. Don't need to tell anyone in this room living with Parkinson's or MS. There's something about those conditions that acts as a drag anchor on your body, which itself causes stress, even if life is great and your environment is perfect. There's also things in our own minds, the way we were brought up, the things that we believe, our, our personalities. Some of those things are also stressful. They push us away from optimal functioning. They don't always push us towards being at our best. So Seligman's simple point about stress is that there are different kinds. This is why I thought we'd talk about puppies, because it's easier to think about concrete examples. So an example of a, of a positive but stressful event for a puppy is an eight-year-old's birthday party. Incredibly exciting, and the puppy enjoys it, as far as you can tell, to a great degree, but afterwards will collapse in the corner and be asleep for three hours just to recover. Mind you, so will I, after an eight-year-old's illness screen, my goodness, but it is kind of fun while it lasts. And actually, during the party, the puppy may get overexcited and start barking and yelping and racing around, and you have to shut it out and give it some time out because it just couldn't cope with the stress it was under, even though it was wonderful from its perspective. You see how that's a positive stress? A negative stress for the puppy is if the neighbor's dog, every time it walks past the front gate, goes berserk and looks as though it's going to leap over the gate and eat it. This is a very negative stress, and the puppy runs inside at that moment and hides between your legs. It's scared out of its little puppy mind, and it's shaking, and uh, so that's a negative stress for the puppy. An environmental stress for the puppy is if we simply don't have enough money to feed it. So it's always hungry. This puppy lives with me in South Sudan, and we, we are keeping it alive, but only just constantly stressed and it won't grow to its full size and it will always be sickly, right? And finally, stressful aspects of the puppy's own condition. What if that puppy was born with a lame back leg? You know, it, it could sort of limp around the house and drag its little leg and you know how puppies are, they wag their tails anyway and they're so excited to see, but you can tell that the way it was born has just held it back. That's an example of something inside the puppy. Or what if the puppy 
was doing fine, but this is a rescue puppy, and we, we've only had it since, it since the puppy was six months, but from the age of two months to six months, it was really badly treated by someone, we don't know who, and was rescued, and now lives with us. But it's been left permanently anxious, and when any, any new person comes into the room, even if it's me, and I've known this puppy for a long time now, it still freaks out. It takes it a good minute or two to calm down. So these are examples. What about in Parkinson's or MS? What's an example of a positive stressful event? Well, let's go back, say, to the wedding. You're attending your granddaughter or grandson's or son or daughter's wedding. It's wonderful. You even like the spouse to be. Fantastic, how good is that? So you're looking forward to it, but the whole business of getting there Coping with the whole thing. Will I be able to cope with the entire thing? The wedding ceremony, that endless wait while photos are taken, and the dinner, and the speeches? Or will I have to pace myself, and I'll go to the ceremony, and then I'm going to go home, and I'll just take two hours, and then I'll go back, and I'll do the dinner and the speeches, but not the dance, and I'll go home, and you know? So it's a positive stress, which we might need to manage. What about negative stresses? Well, I, I don't need to tell any of you about these, but what, what is going to happen when that day comes, when my Parkinson's or my MS means that I'm no longer safe to drive, and a doctor says, I'm sorry, you're no longer safe to drive. It's pretty stressful, and it's a, a big event. For many of us, for many of my patients at least, that sometimes seems more of an event than the moment of diagnosis. It's harder. It really brings things home. So there's an example of a negative stressful event. Environment. What if I just happen to live in a house that's all staircases? Staircases up, staircases down. It's not flat. Nothing is sorted for me. I could choose to live, but that's uh, to live somewhere else. But that's that's a difficult choice for all kinds of reasons. So I'm stuck at the moment, and my environment just makes my life much more difficult and stressful than it would otherwise be. So there's an example of an environmental stress, and finally, something that's a stressful aspect in myself. Well. Uh, a key example of that are simply the motor symptoms, the, the muscle symptoms of Parkinson's or MS, which might mean that my legs just don't do anymore what I want them to do. I can walk, but not freely. So that's all very well if I've got, you know, five minutes to get to the mailbox and back again, but today I need to answer the door quickly for some reason, and I can't. So it's an example of something inside me that will produce a stress on my system. Very simple ideas, right? So that's the beginning of the Seligman model for us. So now let's turn our attention to the next phase of Seligman's model. We've got to think about the coping phase now. And there's a bit of unpacking to do here too. The first thing about coping is that we should include all the things that our body, or, or we, just do unconsciously and automatically. How do we respond without even thinking about it? It's just what we do. Seligman counts that as part of our coping response. For example, if we have, say, a very highly strung kind of temperament, so that we're quite anxious, nervy, and jumpy. That, we're not deciding to be anxious, nervy, and jumpy. We just are. And so if something happens, like the phone rings, we startle. I haven't decided to startle. I, that just happens. It's an automatic response. Or what if my way of coping with adversity in my whole life has been to face it headlong, go barreling into it, to knock it over and continue on my way, come what may, is quite a successful coping strategy for some things, for example, uh, an all-black play, but it doesn't work in every situation in life that successfully. But if it's automatic, it's just what I do, if it, when I'm not thinking, that's what will happen. 
But Seligman also points out that it's not just that. There are also the conscious things, the deliberate responses, the considered responses, the choices that I make. That's obvious. He goes on to think about our coping response in another way by saying it's not just what we do. It's also our emotional response may help or hinder us. It's also our thoughts, what we end up thinking in response to the stress, it may help or hinder us. And our behaviour may help or hinder us. So that's another way of thinking about the coping responses. Physical changes are things like my heart rate going up or uh, my cheeks turning red and other behaviour are the things that you see me do in the room. But they're both a kind of behaviour, but physical responses are automatic, aren't they? Right, now we can look at the result. And the way to judge the result is by saying, or considering these kinds of questions. First of all, does the coping response work? Does it succeed? in helping me maintain good function and carry on with what I want to do and live my life, or not. It's a pretty basic criteria, isn't it, for deciding if that coping was successful or not. Did it work? But that's not the only question. Because the next question is, did it work immediately or only over the long term? Or was it the other way around? Did it not do anything now, but eventually it helped me, or preferably, did it help me right this minute and will continue to help me as I go on managing this stress? So this is a bit of a shade of complication, isn't it? If we want to know how our coping is going, we don't just want to ask, did it work? We want to ask, did it always work? Will it continue to work? We're very short-sighted, aren't we? We want things to work now. And we'll never mind tomorrow, but actually we've got to think about both. And some things that we might choose to do now might make tomorrow worse. <clears throat> and another question to ask ourselves is how much did that cost me? Because there's no point in a coping strategy that's absolutely brilliant but kills you. Is there? or a coping strategy that works really well, but only by completely emptying your tanks. So that if something else happens now, you're in big trouble. I thought the best way of thinking about this now in terms of Parkinson's and MMS is thinking about some of the common traps that I see. And I'm not judging these, I'm just noting them because they're traps that's so easy for us to fall into. But what they do is they exemplify some dangers in the way we might cope. But by the same token, they show us potential alternatives that might help us to manage the stress or the challenge differently. So I want to just talk you through some of these challenges that I see come up, some of the traps I see come up. So the first trap when it comes to coping is inflexibility. By which I mean, I'm, I've got one way of coping. It's very good and it's usually successful. So I'm going to apply it in every situation and I'm going to stick to it even when it doesn't work, or it doesn't match what's going on here. I think we've all observed this in ourselves on occasion, and we've probably all observed this in other people on occasion. But it's a, a very easy trap to fall into, and usually we are not ourselves aware that we've fallen into this trap. It takes someone else to point out that what we're, how we're trying to manage this, whilst it may be very successful for us in many other settings throughout our lives, is not proving to be successful now. And the only logical thing to do is to adapt and choose a different coping strategy 
at that point. Parkinson's and MS can limit some of our coping strategies. So they, they reduce our playbook. So there's less options. But they never reduce our playbook so that there's no options. There's only one thing that you can do. And we've got to be just mindful that if whatever I'm doing is not working, which is to say I'm not coping very well, one of the possibilities is that my method, even if it's tried and true, is not the right method for this problem for me as I am now today. So that's the first trap that I'd like to just suggest to you that I've seen from time to time. The next trap, you can think about it as a kind of uh, tried and true strategy that I'm not flexible enough to uh, change, but actually it's, it's so important it deserves its own line. It's, it's about this thing called avoidance. Now I'm using that term in a, in a technical term, but I think you can immediately uh, get what it means. If, have, have you ever noticed that the way that you, that you cope with some issues is just to avoid them? To, to part them over there, I might get to it later, I'm not dealing with it now. Now, that's a very appropriate thing to do sometimes, right? If my tank is half empty, or I haven't got enough troops behind me to support me, or it's a bad day, if I can avoid dealing with that thing right now, that's not a bad idea. But if it's an important thing, it will need to be dealt with sometime, so I can't continue to avoid. I have to face it at some point. Now, where this gets most problematic is where the thing that I'm avoiding is actually urgent. And either I can't see that, someone else has to tell me, you actually, you have to deal with this now, you can't push this one away. There's some reason that you actually have to grapple with it now, it's unavoidable. You can pretend that you can walk away, but actually it's nipping at your heels and it will cause more trouble. And again, our most reliable um, break to, to pull us into the right way of thinking is someone else at this moment. It's kind of like denial, you, you, know, you know that term. Denial is a fantastic coping strategy, but only in the short term and only if it's not urgent. Like if I'm told that I have the diagnosis of Parkinson's or you know, severe MS or cancer or dementia or some big bad thing and I go, oh, can't, can't be doing with that just now. No, um, thanks doctor, I'm just, I'll, 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 that's enough. I might think about it later, but not, no, I'm not going there now. And after a few weeks or months, I might get there. Now, that, that might be okay if it's not urgent. It might help me to rally my resources and strengthen up and, you know, get strong enough to be able to deal with it in my own time. But some things you can't do that with, right? Some cancers you can't do that with. You've got to deal with them now or there's no hope. Cut it out now or things are not going to go well for you. You know, you can't spend six months deciding when to cope. The other problem with avoidance is when anxiety is the driver of avoidance. Now, avoidance is a fantastic treatment for anxiety. It works. Yeah? If I'm terrified of dogs, so terrified that I have a full-blown panic attack when, when dogs are coming towards me, then avoiding all dogs, which is just possible in this life, will mean I never have a panic attack for the rest of my days. It's a great coping strategy. It'd be better if I panicked at, say, lifts or flying, because they are slightly easier to avoid. 
in a city like Christchurch. But there are some things that cause anxiety that are not avoidable. The only way to avoid them is to make my life shrink. And the problem with avoidance as a treatment for anxiety is that the anxiety gets bigger, not smaller, behind the scenes. It's just part of how we're wired. So if, for example, I am becoming increasingly anxious about what other people might think of me because of my tremor or the way I look or how my voice sounds or what my memory is like or whatever, Right? And it's really uncomfortable. It's a horrible feeling, the feeling I get in a conversation when I see that person look at me in that way and that person act as though I'm not here and that person was frankly rude to my face. And, you know, this happens. Yeah, I'm, none of us are making these stories up. And so I'm now anxious about that. And so I sort of figure, well, um, I might choose not to go out and about unless I have to. Now, that will really help with my anxiety, it will. But the trouble is that the anxiety about talking to people will get bigger. So now it's going to be hard to go to the shop and talk to the uh, shopkeeper just about buying a bottle of milk. So I might start avoiding that too. And then it's going to get hard even seeing my family. I just, it's just the thought of it. It, it really revs me up, and so I stop doing that too, but the anxiety gets bigger and bigger, and soon my entire life is my living room, my kitchen, my bathroom, and my bedroom, that's it. You, that is not fanciful. So I help people whose lives have got that small because they've got stuck in a loop of avoidance, and never intended to, it was never their intention, it's not their fault, it's just a part of how we're made. And the best way is to use avoidance very sparingly because it's a hiding to nowhere if it becomes our chief strategy. That's a trap that we can fall into. I am not criticizing. I am not saying this is a weakness. I'm just saying this is a trap. It's a coping trap. Avoidance is a great coping mechanism. It's extremely human. All of us do it. It's just a question of how much, and is it starting to have a bigger effect on me than the anxiety was? In which case, this is now my problem. Tricky. Another trap I wanted to point out to you is just have a wee chat about grieving. Now, how does grieving fit in with stress and coping? Grieving is what humans do. Automatically, when they're faced with loss, or threatened loss, so a real loss or a threatened loss, grief is just what we do. It's wired into us. There are cultural versions of it, but the core is the same. And many of you will know one of the chief writers about this, whose work is greatly misrepresented, but the chief writer is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who never said there are stages to grieving, but did point out that when humans grieve, it can look like different faces. One of the faces that grief can wear in human beings is that we look really low and depressed. Another face that grief can wear in human beings is that we're really angry, very angry. Another face that grief can wear in human beings is a kind of calm acceptance and just pulling it all in as a fact of life and somehow living with it in a, in a calm and positive way. How good would that be? And another face of grief is denying that the, that the loss ever happened or that it's imminent. And we've already talked about that a bit, and in the short term, it's very helpful. 
in that final face of grief that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about is closer to their anger, but it's slightly different. It's bargaining. It's, it's if I do this, if I go on multivitamins and go walking for 20 minutes every morning and read on the internet and do all kinds of bizarre things to my house and, and stop drinking for the rest of my days and pray for 10 minutes every morning and go to church on Sundays, then could this cup pass from my lips? So, five faces of grief, and Kubler-Ross's big contribution was just to describe them. These things happen. They're normal. They're not illness. doesn't mean that you are sick with a major depressive episode if you have a phase of looking and feeling quite low and depressed uh, for a time as part of my grieving. Now, in Parkinson's and MS, these are the kinds of illnesses which unlike, say, a stroke, they're not one-off things that happen to you and then you grieve because there's been a loss and then hopefully at some point there's a more or less resolution to that. Now, I'm not belittling or minimising a stroke, but a stroke or a heart attack or a broken leg is a <laughs> one-off thing. Parkinson's and MS progress so the first moment is often the diagnosis. That's when, in my mind, I had myself as a reasonably fit person who was doing well in the world, and yes, one day I'll get some stuff, but I'm doing well right now, hang on a minute. Terribly sorry, madam, terribly sorry, sir, I need to tell you that you have Parkinson's disease, a chronic and incurable neurological illness. We've got medicines to help you with the symptoms and various things to help you out in your life, but we have no cure and we can't slow it down. What? You know, this is quite a different world view about myself, isn't it? That I have to adjust to. So that's often the first moment of grieving. But, you know, many people I meet do well with that. And, and they grieve and they move through that and it still gets them sometimes, but they're, they're okay again. But the trouble with Parkinson's and with progressive MS is that it doesn't stop. So next year, there's something else, isn't there? Now, I'm having trouble driving. So that might have to go. That's huge. That's another thing. Or now, I'm going to need to move out of this house and move into a place that's better for me. But I love this house. There's another thing. Yeah. Or what if one day, no person, even a person as fabulous as my spouse, could manage the care needs that I have 24-7? No one could do it. So I might have to move away from my spouse. That's huge. What? You know, it's, these are, this is a key problem with managing grief with something like Parkinson's, MS, or any of the more chronic diseases. It means that we think we've done it once, but we may be called upon to do it again and again. But still, grieving is normal. It may not be pleasant, but it's normal, so we're not necessarily sick, and it's it's how humans cope. It's part of our automatic coping response. And it does actually help in the longer term. That's why it's built in. But it's tricky. So this is the third trap, is misinterpreting grief as meaning there's something wrong with me. Something that needs to be fixed. But actually, it may be just grieving. It's a normal part of how I'm going to cope. It will lessen, just needs time and a bit of support, and I'll be fine. But she's a hard road today. And the final trap I'm putting out there, uh, especially for those of us who don't have Parkinson's or MS, we can become one trick helping ponies where we just have one response, and that's fix, fix the problem. What's the problem? How can I fix that? Let's break it down, let's do something. Or we're rescuers. I can see a problem coming up. I'm gonna 
rush in on my white horse or in my helicopter and I'm going to pick you up before that happens and pop you down in safe ground and we'll start again. Those are both great responses in the right place at the right time, but they're not always the right thing to do. A life, for example, where we are constantly helicoptered out of potentially difficult situations caused by my Parkinson's or my MS by other well-meaning people may well not be a life worth living. So I never get to stand on my own two feet and just get on with it. And sometimes I'll fall down. Yes, I will. But sometimes I won't either. So, and anyway, if I do, how bad was that, actually? Sometimes very bad. Thanks, helicopter. But sometimes that's one helicopter too many. So as care partners, we need to be careful not to fall into the trap of being a one-trip pony. We always rescue or we always fix. Now here we'll get into a nasty piece of gender stereotyping men. And we'll say men. That one thing that our, those of us that have female partners might say about us when we're not in the room is that we're a little bit useless when they come to us with our female partners come to us with a, a problem or an issue because actually all they wanted was a bit of empathy. Gosh, that, that has been a bad day. Gosh, that does sound awful. Heavens. And what happened next? And what they do not want is, oh, right, we should do something about that person. What are we, how are we going to solve this problem? What you need to do, and we get into our mansplaining thing, and off we go. Now, fixing the problem is, is great sometimes, but it's, if, it's, if it's our only trick, that's a trap that we can fall into as care partners. So I just wanted to point that out. So what are my top tips? So the first top tip, sorry, first top tip is you'll be able to cope better with the things that Parkinson's and MS throw at you, either if you're living with them or you care about someone very much who's living with them. You'll be able to cope much better if your body and your mind and your soul are really well fed, well stocked, full tanks, doing good, except for the Parkinson's or MS. So sometimes the problem solving is not about solving the problem of the Parkinson's or the MS, it's about stocking up on good things that help us. Am I eating well? Am I sleeping as well as possible? Have I got some good things going on in the week that feed my soul? Am I meeting with some friends and filling my emotional tank? Spiritually, how am I doing? Is my church the top of the hill? When's the last time I've been to the top of the hill and looked at the view? Is my church church? When's the last time I've been to church? You know, just whatever it takes to fill my heart and, and my soul and my body with good things. I will be able to be more resilient if I do that. The five ways of well-being in Canterbury, we've seen these things a lot, haven't we, since the earthquakes. But I just want to let you know that these are ways of filling your tank, which sound simple and sound common sense, and yet so few of us are actually well engaged on all five ways of well-being. And they are evidence-based, they're science, they're not just natty cartoons on posters to encourage the young ones after the earthquake. They're good stuff that actually make a difference for coping. Another top tip. Obviously, I will cope better with whatever MS or Parkinson's throw at me if my symptoms are under the best control they can be right now. So when is the last time I saw my specialist? What did my specialist, my GP, my Parkinson's nurse, whoever, what advice did they give me and how closely am I actually managing to follow that? So we try and optimise our symptom control. That just helps the drag on our coping that the disease is adding to the picture. Do you know that phrase, um, don't just stand there, do something? Do you know that phrase? Don't just stand there, do something. That's a great mum phrase. Don't just stand there, you Egypt, do something. Well, actually, sometimes, a little bit like the problem solving one trick pony, don't just do something. Just stand there, just stop. 
And for us as care partners, first, do nothing. Just be together with the person. It's difficult right now. Coping is not going well. That's step one. Just be there. What we say in medicine sometimes is first, take your own pulse. It's just a way of suggesting don't rush in. Just stop and look after the emotional need first before rushing into problem solving. Here's the kind of know thyself Greek philosophy take on this problem. Know what your automatic knee-jerk coping responses are. The ones that you do without thinking. The ones that when you're under a lot of pressure will just come out. Know what they are. Because sometimes that will be very effective, but sometimes you'll have to hold yourself back before you go down that track, because it might not be right. So know yourself, know what are my automatic responses. And once again, because they're automatic, we might not be so aware of them. But other people are painfully aware of them often, and they might be able to gently shine a mirror on what is our, without thinking about it, coping strategy, which will have its upside, but it might also have the downside. And finally, some things are going to happen, or are very likely to happen. What would it be like to develop a plan in advance? When my Parkinson's one day, probably, hopefully not, but probably, reaches the state that I'm no longer able to drive, how are we going to manage that? because I live in Christchurch in a suburb which is not served by public transport and I can't afford taxis and anyway they're never there quite when you need them so what are we going to do? What is my plan? If one day, heaven forbid, my Ennis or my Parkinson's got to the point where I could no longer live in my own home. If that ever happened, I hope not. But if it did, how am I going to deal with that? What would I need to have in place to make that work as well as it possibly could for me? Advanced plans always need to be provisional, right? Because you never know exactly what will happen. But if you've got a rough idea, you can come up with a rough plan. And, and you don't have to follow it to the letter. But by having had some of these conversations and ideas in advance, you will be in a stronger position to cope when the proverbial really does hit the fan. Okay? None of this is rocket science. Now, you don't need a psychiatrist of old age to come and tell you this stuff. However, I hope that just by putting it in this different way, drawing it together in one place, and showing how it relates to some science, actually, some thinking about this over many decades, it can take what for many of us is common sense, but open our eyes to it in a different way. And that's what I'm aiming to do for you today. Now, a final question was, what do we do when our coping is completely overwhelmed? You are here. So what do I do when it's not a matter of how could I cope better, how's my coping going? I am not coping. It's, I'm overwhelmed right now. And particularly for those of us that are care partners of, of someone who's in that situation, or just in ordinary life when we see this situation, what do we do? Well, again, I'm, I just, I'm so not wanting to teach anyone how to suck anything, an egg least of all, but the big question is, is this a short-term thing or not? If it's short-term, this is what you do. You batten down the hatches and you wait. Because it will pass. That's all you do. It's all you have to do. It's all you need to do. You do need to make sure it's safe. And that's why you have to batten down the hatches. Right? So some things are not safe, uh, so you just have to make them safe. Here's an example. My dad is living in a, in a, in a 
sort of independent unit in a, in a village and he is alone. And if he was uh, no longer able to walk safely for a period, like he got the flu or something, <coughs> it will probably pass but he's not able to manage in that place right now. What we need to do is my sister or I have to hop on a plane and go up and stay with him. Uh, and he'd be happy with that, we do that all the time. But this time we're doing it to make it safe enough while we just sit and ride out this storm and then we'll see what we've got after the hurricane has passed by. So that's the management, when you're totally overwhelmed, but everyone agrees, including you, this, this will eventually pass, but right now I can't be doing with it. You just batten down the hatches, stay safe, and do nothing. Just wait it out. And equally simply, what do you do if, okay, this will pass, but the trouble is I can't make it safe. It's too overwhelming, someone's gonna die, it's, dreadful, or it's not going to pass. I'm not coping, but I'm not coping because of something that's not going to be fixed. It's not going to pass. Well, you just have to get help at that point. It's, it's not rocket science. Where from? Well, family and friends first. GP and the people in the NGO, second, you know, people from Parkinson's Society and the multiple scrolls, help, help, I'm in trouble. And hospital food. Totally. No one will argue. Ladies and gentlemen, what I've tried to do is simply talk through what I've learned from Martin Seligman, what I've learned from my patients and, and their families, uh, and what I've learned from having to be a specialist for people where it's all broken down and they've needed an, a specialist and the team behind me, which are more important than me usually, to, to come in and, you know, like a horse's mean and put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So I think I've learned something from that and I just wanted to share it with you. Now what we're going to do for our remaining few minutes is uh, this may have prompted some thoughts or, or questions or observations that you have, very happy to talk them through, but this is not a clinic, right? So I can't, I, I can't take your specific situation, give you advice, no? because I don't know you, and it's not safe for you, it's probably not safe for me. So. Um, it's not a clinic, but if, uh, if there are any questions or comments or reflections that you have, very happy. So um, please feel free to sit your hand up if, if there's something that you'd like to say. And I'll repeat it for those of us whose hearing is not so good, so that we can all hear what the reflection or comment or question was. Does anyone have anything that um, the Seligman Coping with Puppies talk has prompted them to think? Yes, ma'am. I was in total denial for three years, and I was going to my doctor, and every time I went for something else, he said, is it time, is it time? And I said no. And then two, two and a half years ago, I went to see him, and I said, it's time. And because I knew what was coming, because my sister had Parkinson's, and because I probably put myself in that denial situation for a long time, more than I should have, but I coped with what was coming and I've made preparation for everything before I was told. Yeah, yeah. so that's a really lovely and very personal story, isn't it? But the story was a, a, a person who, uh, and thank you, whose sister had gone down the Parkinson's road before her, but she herself took a while to accept that it we, you know, I don't even want to hear about it just yet uh, with the GP, but then eventually did and has planned ahead. And the thing about that story that I particularly love, that it just rang a bell for me because of something in my own life that I just didn't deal with for such a long time, and I was talking about what was going on with a very wise friend in this case, not a GP, and he could totally see what was going on, but he never rammed it down my throat. He just waited until I was ready. 
And I think I would have trusted him in the same way that you could probably have trusted your GP, that at some point, if you or I hadn't got there ourselves, they would have just said, no, it, we do need to talk about this now. And, and I would have said, it's not time. And they would have said, well, actually it is time, so we're going to. I, I think I would have trusted them to do that, but I love them, love my friend, and in your case, I really respect your doctor, that they didn't ram it down your throat until you were ready, until I was ready with my friend. Isn't that, that's a real a wise, a, you know, going to be wise as a friend or a GP to know when not to push and when to push, right? Um, but we have to be allowed to be ready when we're ready with changing our coping strategy or opening our eyes to the situation that needs coping. Mm, great story. Yes, sir. I had, my, I had my diagnosed with Parkinson's eight years ago. And so I haven't been able to cope so far with the physical symptoms of Parkinson's. But from time to time, so it hasn't been easy lately, I have anxiety attacks. First of all, what is very simple, is mice. I cope with the anxiety. Okay, so that, that was a great question, and it, and it really is a great question. And it's no surprise to anyone sitting in this room that the mental health side of Parkinson's and also of multiple sclerosis can sometimes be worse than the physical side. And the, the top thing on the list is anxiety. Yeah? And anxiety happens in Parkinson's and in multiple sclerosis, not just because they're anxiety-provoking things. It happens because of the changes in our brain. The double whammy. And the, the question was, with that anxiety, you know, I'm coping with my motor stuff, not too bad, but the anxiety, now that's a test, right? And the specific question was, what did, uh, what's the role of medicines there? And the reason why that's a good question is, number one, because it's so common. So our, our gentleman who's brought it up is not the only person sitting in this room for whom this is an issue. But there's a, a subtlety to it that I want to bring out for you when it comes to medicines as a way of coping. Generally speaking, in this world, there are two types of medicine for any given problem. And it is completely true of anxiety. There are medicines that go to the cause and fix it, and therefore the problem stops happening or isn't so bad. For example, in anxiety, medicines that go to the cause of the anxiety in our brain and reset that to a less anxious setting, and so we're less anxious, hooray for us. But there are also medicines that are just band-aids. Thank God for band-aids. But that's all they are. They stick a band-aid on it and make it better for a while, and then the band-aid falls off. The cause of it just sails on, the symptom is still there, but it was better for a while because I stuck a band-aid on it. Yeah? Give you another example, nausea. There are tablets that are anti-nausea tablets. They just make you feel less nauseous. They don't fix why you're nauseous. Does that make sense? There might be a different tablet that fixes that. So some of us get nauseous because we've got too much acid in our tummies. So we might take a medicine that over the weeks turns my tummy acid down, and now I'm not nauseous anymore. But previous, while I was waiting for that tablet that goes underneath and fixes the core problem to work, I had to take an anti-nausea tablet whenever I felt so sick I was going to vomit. You get it? So, with anxiety, drugs that end in azepam, diazepam, lorazepam, clonazepam, are band-aids. They're really good band-aids, but that's all they are. So if I'm really anxious and I take an azepam drug, I'll stop being so anxious. Until the drug wears off. And then I'm back where I was. So that's problem number one. It's just to be aware in our minds. What, what is it doing, but what is it not doing? Other medicines go underneath and try and turn the anxiety dial down 
And those drugs are called antidepressants, but actually it's not a very good name because they're actually anti-anxiety drugs as well. They just tune the knob down if we're really anxious. Now, I warned you about avoidance, didn't I? When it came to anxiety, I said there's a particular problem with avoidance for anxiety, is that the anxiety tends to get bigger if I avoid things. And this is a catch with the azepams, because they're a type of avoidance. I'm not criticizing them, I prescribe them. But what they do is they say, big bad dog, don't you can't worry, I've switched it off for half an hour. So they don't do anything for your anxiety for dogs. In fact, your anxiety for dogs may increase. So we have to be especially careful of band-aid treatments for anxiety. But I'm really pleased they exist. I prescribe them. In the short term, they're often magic. In the longer term, they may or may not be useful. It depends, and we need wisdom at that point, so we need a good doctor. So there's the place of medicine to manage these things that are hard to cope with in Parkinson's and MS. I'm glad we've got medicines. I'm glad we've got cinnametamatapar. I'm glad we've got rapinarol for restlessly. I'm glad we've got all that stuff. I'm glad we've got our immune treatments for MS. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad. But none of them are, you know, scot-free, take one of these, you'll be great. They all have their costs, and we always need to think, is this a band-aid treatment, which may be really useful, but it's just not going to fix anything, or is this a go underneath and try and fix something treatment? And that just will vary how long I want to be on it, and how much, and how many side effects would I tolerate, and you know, so I want to have that discussion with my doctor. And, and actually, Doc, thanks for telling me about that. That could well be useful. I can see that, and, and I totally get that other people find it really useful and, and that you recommend it. What are the other things that are available to help me cope with this as well that aren't drugs? What are the other things? Maybe I need a double whammy, and I'd love to be able to just do the other thing eventually. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. Can you tell me? So that's a really good approach to take. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to stop now. We have been, I have been, you have been, I've been gassing on for an hour, and I'm as dry as a chip, and if I keep talking, um, my son, who has now arrived home from school on the other side of the city, will be getting really annoyed with me. So I'm going to stop. But I was really, really excited to get the uh, invitation to come and be one of your speakers on beginning this kind of seminar and workshop series. And I hope that one or two things of what I've been able to shed light on in a different way, mostly stuff that you already knew, but just in a different way. I hope that's given you a germ of an idea that you think that could help me actually, or that could help this other person that I care a lot about. I hope so. So I wish you all the very, very best for the rest of this gorgeous but changeable spring. And I'll see you on the other side of summer.